Hi everyone. I um, this is my first time doing a uh, a Facebook Live, so um, I'm not sure what's going on or what the delay is. Uh, so let me know in the comments uh, if if you're seeing this, Matt. Uh, I see that you're in the comments. Are you seeing the feed? I know there is a uh, delay. I did some tests yesterday, and, and I had like a, um, a seven-minute delay, which is um, I might as well be um, great, terrific. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so the, the the delay is not as bad as it was yesterday, and that's great. So um, I think um, great, terrific. People are here. That's great. Three people. That's a quorum, isn't it? So um, I think we can uh, probably get started. I um, uh, I'm going to do a Q and A afterwards, but as I'm actually doing the presentation, there is um, there's no way for me to actually see the the comments coming in. So uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that. So if you have an actual question um, or comments to make, that's fine. Put them in, but I'm not going to start uh, reading questions and taking Q and A until the very end of the presentation. Another thing is I'm. I'm broadcasting from Florida, and we just had a little rainstorm come by, which is typical of Florida. So if anything throws us off, um, that might be one of it, one of the things. Um, and I um, have very, um, uh, very slow upload speeds, and uh, I'm not sure the quality or uh, even how long the stream will maintain. So uh, because of that, I won't be doing any dancing. Uh, fast movements, uh, no acrobatics this time around. So just wanted to let everyone know. So anyway, uh, this is a presentation I gave uh, Wednesday night at uh, the Orlando uh, uh, the Orlando Library, the, the main branch of the Orange County Library System downtown. And uh, we had a pretty good turnout. About 12 people showed up. And a lot of friends on Facebook were... Um, we're disappointed that they, they didn't get to see it. And uh, I don't know if there's a lot of information here um, that will help everybody, but it'll be fun to give Facebook Live a try and, and, uh, and see how it works here. So uh, that being said, I'm gonna get started here. Switch over to this, great. All right, so um, if you don't know who I am, my name is Eddie Pittman. Uh, I'm a cartoonist. And uh, when I was a kid, I won a 10-speed bicycle from the Kellogg's Stick Up for Breakfast contest for drawing my favorite Kellogg's character eating breakfast. And uh, that was great because it's given me validation for years in my, my chosen field, being a cartoonist. And uh, thanks to that, now instead of just being known as a cartoonist, I'm actually known as an award-winning cartoonist. I've worked on a lot of stuff throughout my 30-year career as a cartoonist. Uh, the majority of it has been in animation. I've worked on feature films like Mulan, uh, Tarzan, Lilo and Stitch, and uh, more recently I was a writer and story artist on uh, Disney's show Phineas and Ferb, where I also got to be the voice of uh, of Darth Vader in the Phineas and Ferb Star Wars episode, which was a, a dream come true, you know, uh, um, living out the lifetime goal of being a Dark Lord of the Sith. I also do a, a graphic novel series, as many of you know, since you're on the Red's Planet page, called uh, Red's Planet, and it's published by Amulet Books. The first book came out about a year and a half ago, and the second book, Friends and Foes, is coming out on November 7th. So just right around the corner. So there is so much to cover on writing for graphic novels that there's no possible way in the amount of time that we have to cover all of it. And to be absolutely honest, I have no idea how other people write graphic novels. I can only tell you how I work on my graphic novels and the creative approach that, that I take. So, um, that's basically the approach I'm going to give here. This is the talk is how I go about creating stuff. And like I said, it's an overview. There are not a lot of details, but things go well here today. Uh, maybe we can do this again sometime. So one, one question that I think uh, 
every creator gets um, at some time or another is where do you get your ideas? It's very common, whether you're a writer or a, uh, an artist, where do you get your ideas? Well, I, I've gotten a couple of ideas right around here on uh, Interstate 4 going from Orlando to the Tampa area when I was commuting for work. I've gotten several ideas when I was cutting grass. Uh, that, those, some, some of them are pretty good. But the most of my ideas these days come from uh, taking a shower. Um, but those are ideas with a little eye. The big ideas, the ones where an idea for a big story or a movie or a graphic novel comes, those ideas are a little, um, a little more difficult to explain. Uh, sometimes they just come in pieces. Most of the times they come in pieces. You might see an image in a magazine or a, uh, um, a billboard or, or read a news article, see a movie, and something spurs an idea. And it's like most ideas, it's, it, they come in incomplete fragments. They're, they're like stray pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And that's how the slow creative process begins. Uh, without the age of that, you know, that beautiful picture on, on the puzzle box, um, and you, with most of the pieces still missing, you try to make sense of this puzzle. And in the beginning, a couple of the pieces seem to fit together. And after a while, an image starts to form in your mind of what this completed picture would look like. But as most artists and writers can tell you, when all the pieces are assembled, the image is usually much different than what you envisioned. By the end of this long process, Personally, I'm often skeptical, skeptical of what I've ended up with, and, and I, I can't imagine that anyone would actually be interested in it. And uh, I think that's just part of being an artist. Uh, the excitement of the idea is usually followed by self-doubt. And oftentimes those ideas kind of get put on a shelf, and, uh, and it sits there and waits. So all I knew about Red's Planet when the idea first came to me was it was like Walt Kelly's Pogo, one of my favorite comics. Okay, my favorite comic strip. And that it would have quirky characters and, and zany antics, and um, it took place in space. That's all I really knew. There was no character of Red. There was no title. It was just this one simple concept. So after a while, um, really about eight years or so, I... I filled in those puzzle pieces and started to come up with the idea, but I still had doubts about it. Um, I had done a, a rough draft of a screenplay and still not sure what form I wanted to tell the story in. And one day, I was hanging out with my seven-year-old daughter at the time, Jenny, and to pass the time, I decided to tell her the story of Red's Planet. And I, I pitched it to her as if I were pitching to a... Uh, a, a director or, or uh, a story team, uh, you know, with the energetic hands, and those of you who know me know that that's everything I talk about, uh, and glossing over those few little puzzle pieces that I hadn't found yet, and, and she listened, you know, intently, and there was an occasional wow, and she seemed to enjoy it. Um, and I, I didn't really expect that it would stick with her, though, you know, like one of her favorite movies or books, but... I was a little surprised a few days later when I heard her describing a scene from Red's Planet to her mom, um, and she told it with the same kind of excitement as if she had just watched it on DVD. And that's when I realized that maybe I did have an idea for a story that, that would, would be interesting to tell and, and would find an audience. And um, even if I didn't find an audience, I'd at least have an audience of one. And I think this is something really important that when you're creating your story, you need to have an audience in mind, whether that audience is a family member, a loved one, a group of friends, or even yourself. Know who you're creating for. Um, and, and I think this is a problem a lot of people get into is they try to guess what an audience would want or what would sell to a editor, and they're creating something that um, doesn't have a sense of honesty. The story is, is um, um, seems kind of manufactured, you know? Um, 
plastic, saccharin, artificial. So I developed Red's Planet over, um, I jumped into production immediately and I thought the, the quickest way to do this would be uh, as a graphic novel. And I could do it as a webcomic. And I did a kind of a proof of concept. I took chapter four of the, uh, of the story, which was just a big tentpole action scene where two of the main characters, Red and Goose, come together for the first time. And I thought this was a great way to, to tell the story and, and just to, to test it out. Um, so I did this 22-page uh, comic. Uh, I printed it with Kablam, a wonderful um, uh, uh, print-on-demand, uh, low-press-run uh, comic book printer and they're here in Orlando and they do uh, Barry Gregory is the owner and they do fantastic work I've used them several times and I printed these up and I took them to comic conference at a comic convention and showed them around so I jumped right in and 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 I started posting it as a website um, and uh, as a web comic and uh, that was in 2009 and I got a great response and in 2010 I launched it um, the beginning of the story and and uh, and we went uh, for for several years and uh, printing it, you know, one page a week with occasional breaks, hiatuses. So let's talk a little bit about comics. And, and one thing you're going to hear from a lot of people, uh, and although this is kind of, this attitude's dying out, is that writing comics isn't writing or graphic novels aren't real books. And... Um, I think this attitude is changing thanks to a lot of young librarians who have embraced graphic novels and shared them with, uh, with kids in the libraries. Graphic novels, especially graphic novels for children, have really taken off. And if the old adage is true that a picture is worth a thousand words, then um, I figured out that Red's Planet was actually a 1.1 million word novel which isn't too bad. That's up there with, uh, you know, Stephen King. Um, so essentially though, comics are a visual medium. They're not just about words. It's the strength of the, the artwork that really carries a comic book. And I think it's, it's, it's more closely related to cinema. So if you were to look at a kind of a timeline or, or a, a way of measuring here between literature and cinema, comics fall a lot closer to cinema. There are times even when we tell stories or, or sequences or scenes in comics with no words whatsoever. So the language of comics is much more graphic than it is literature. Now, being a comic writer, there's, um, you, you've really got to have an understanding of several different disciplines to, I think, be a successful comic writer. You don't have to be a master of any of them, but you do need to understand filmmaking, the language of filmmaking, shot composition, staging, editing, timing. A lot of these things translate. And, and one reason this is important is that our current visual language is really set in film and television, and we're a visual society. So filmmaking uh, is a great way to start to learn that and studying filmmaking, at least through books, uh, because it is the visual language we speak. Visual design, also very important. Understanding how visual design works. You don't have to be an artist necessarily, uh, but understanding what visual uh, appeal is, understanding line and color and other visual elements and how they work together in harmony, or um, uh, how they work in opposition of one another, if there's certain things, uh, effects that you want to create, um, or in designing a story. Comics, the language of comics is very important, and uh, there is a definite language and an understanding of how we read comics. A lot of times I hear from, especially parents, uh, when, when uh, their kids have graphic novels, they say, I don't know how to read these to them. Well, it's kind of simple. It goes from left to right, just like regular reading goes, and up and down. And 
Um, so it seems intimidating to a lot of people, but there is a visual language to writing comics and where things show supposed to be and, you know, what a, what a gutter is and the length of time that passes between gutters. Scott McCloud gets into a lot of this in his book, uh, Understanding Comics. And you need to understand story, and this is really the most important part. You need to understand how a story works, what a story is, and, um, and all aspects of storytelling. Now, I think there are about three types of comic writers, basically. There's the auteur, who the writer, artist, sole creator of something that does everything, controls it all. They're the collaborators, uh, the writer, writer and artist teams who work together closely. Um, and uh, when a problem arises, they solve it together. They come up with, with storytelling ideas and, and together. The, the visual... The visuals work with the writing. And then there's work for hire. And this is when a publishing company hires a, a writer and they give them a, an assignment. The writer turns it in and then it's handed off to an artist. This is, this is how most of the, uh, traditionally, this is how most of the, the monthly comics are done from like DC and Marvel and, and uh, Dark Horse and Image. Um, the writer writes a script, the artist does the art. Uh, sometimes now, thanks to the internet, there's a conversation, but you know, many times there's not, and part of that's because of the the really fast schedule of production. So, if you look at auteurs, uh, some of the great auteurs of comics would be Art Spiegelman's Mouse, the story of uh, of his his parents escaping the Holocaust and their experiences during uh, uh, the Holocaust, and it's told in um, as the the Jews are are mice and the Nazis are cats, and it's a very powerful work. You know, describing it that way sounds like a Tom and Jerry cartoon, but it's a very powerful uh, work. Jeff Smith's Bone, a fantasy, uh, epic fantasy story with uh, very whimsical characters, uh, the the Bone cousins, which are a lot like Carl Barks' um, uh, telling of of, uh, of Scrooge McDuck, very cartoony. But then there's this this rich world of, of fantasy and um, like, like Tolkien. And then there's Raina Telgemeier who, who wrote Smile. And Raina tells very personal stories about growing up and her relationships with her sister and, and um, the time that she injured her, her, her teeth and Smile and, and not only the physical consequences of that, but the emotional consequences of fitting in with, with this obvious uh, barrier um, that she had now um, in, in the social world. So th these are what all tours do. And I, I found it very interesting after I looked at it that two of these uh, all tours were very personal stories and uh, about something that happened in their life or in their parents' life. And I, I realized that a lot of, a lot of all tours do that. This is where personal stories come from. Then there are the collaborators, teams like Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons with The Watchmen. Wendy Peeney and Richard Peeney with ElfQuest, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby with the Fantastic Four, the Avengers and the Hulk and all these great Marvel um, uh, characters and, and, and titles. Now, Jack Kirby was a work for hire, technically, but I think the relationship that he had with Stan Lee um, qualifies it to be a collaboration. I, I, the, the unique relationship of how Marvel worked at that time created the the atmosphere of, of collaboration that I'm talking about. Now, out of these three um, um, different groups of writers, or three different kinds of writers, the, the one that I think has the most strength, or at least appeals to me, is the auteur or the sole creator. And a lot of that is because I enjoy controlling all aspects. Even though I'm not always happy with what I do, um, I like to be able to uh, put forth my vision. So, what is story? This is a question that I think is, is important. We don't always think about what story really is. Um, so, I've, and it took me a long time to realize this, and it was, it's kind of embarrassing because I always feel like when I say this, um, everybody it's a big duh moment from everybody else. But um, I came to this very late in life. I'm a slow learner. Um, 
story is character. And that was a revelation for, for me when I realized that. When we create story, we create characters. You can't create characters without story. And you can't create story without characters. There's, they're intertwined. It's a simple concept. There's a funny argument that happens within writing groups um, about what's more important, character or plot. And it's really a ridiculous argument because you can't have one without the other. They are intertwined. Um, and, and I think this is something we innately know. Um, and I know children know that. When they do a drawing, they bring you a drawing and show you, look what I drew. It's not just a character or a person. There's a whole backstory to this person. You know, they, this is what they had for breakfast. Uh, this is what they like to wear. And, and their favorite, um, their friend's name is this. And they love to, uh, they really want to find um, um, the, you know, the, the grail, which is um, the cup that they like to drink milk out of. Whatever it may be. I don't know what it is. But there's a story behind it. They know that the character they're drawing, as they're drawing it, there's a story going on in their head. When I was a kid, I was taught that stories had a beginning, a middle, and an end. And, and uh, I look back now and I realize, well, yeah, but a lot of things have a beginning, a middle, and an end. A, a loaf of banana bread has a beginning, a middle, and an end. But, but a story is more than that. Um, a story is exposition, conflict, and resolution in its simplest form. And those things actually exist in character as well. We, when we talk about exposition, the character has a backstory. Most of it the, the reader will never know about. But there's something that the baggage that this character brings into the story that makes them who they are. It's their exposition. Conflict is what they're going through, whether it's a physical conflict of trying to, to uh, achieve a goal or, or an inner conflict of, of uh, feelings or emotions or, or rejection. And then there's the resolution of how they, how they bring their story together, how they bring themselves, the character, to resolving their conflicts. And uh, as artists, we try, to, um, we try to find ways to incorporate the, some of these things in the design, exposition. Um, and, and conflict of the character. How do we incorporate that into the way the character looks? So that when you see the character immediately, you know this isn't a very happy character. This is a character that doesn't have a lot of confidence. Or this is a character that's really proud. So um, there's a visual aspect to that as well. So story equals conflict. That's the main thing. Conflict is the most important story, part of a story. I, and, and the character is revealed through this conflict. How they react to the conflict tells you who this character is. They can, re, they can react positively, they can react negatively. But it's them reacting to it that, um, that, that tells us who the, their character really is, what their character really is. There are two questions I think you have to ask yourself when you're writing a story. You need to know or ask yourself, what does your character want? And what does your character need? And these are two very different things. What your character wants and needs aren't always the same things. Most of the time they aren't. If they are the same thing, you need to rethink the story. In the movie The Incredibles, Bob Parr, Mr. Incredible, wants to relive the glory days. He wants to be super again. Um, he, he, he even leaves his family to go fight crime at night just to, just to feel good about himself again, right? Try to relive those glory days. But what he needs is his family. And he comes to understand that throughout the movie The Incredibles. And in the end, he gets both. Indiana Jones wants fortune and glory. He wants the Ark of the Covenant. He wants the Shankara Stones. He wants the Grail. But what he needs is he needs to save Marion. He needs to rescue the village children. He needs the love and respect of his father. And Indy 
always chooses the right thing in the end. He lets go of fortune and glory and makes the right decision. So these are, are questions that are really important that we need to know about our own character, what their needs are and what their wants are. Okay, so the nuts and bolts of writing a graphic novel, how I write a graphic novel. So one of the first things that I do is I write a log line. Now a log line is a, a brief uh, summary, usually one sentence of your story. And uh, it's, a film, it's a film term, basically, a screenwriting term. Um, so the summary states the conflict of the story and it, it gives a, a synopsis of the plot and, and the emotional hook of the story. Um, and it's one sentence. It's a way of pitching a story to someone who you just met. Hey, here's what my story is. But I think it's good for us to understand where our story is going so that when we're writing, we can put it up on our computer screen, uh, on a post-it note in front of us, and we know, hey, don't get off track. This is where my story's going. So the log line, the original log line for Red's Planet was a young girl is abducted by aliens and finds herself marooned on a planet with alien misfits. It's clunky. It's very short. There's no emotional uh, context to it, but this is what I knew I wanted this story to be. Now I... When you do a log line, you don't just get one shot at it. You sit there and you massage it. You move the words around. You find other log lines. You know, a good source for it is flipping through Netflix and seeing what the one line description of the movie is or looking at TV Guide, if that's still a thing. So the second the time around, or at least the final pass, I think what I finally got ready or, or, or got the log line to be, was this. Red, a 10-year-old Earth girl is mistakenly kidnapped by a UFO and marooned on a distant planet where she finds herself in a contest of wills with a menagerie of misfit aliens and the planet's grumpy custodian. So, it's, it's a clearer concept of what the story could be and what the idea is around the story. And there's an emotional aspect as well, read in a, in a contest of wills. Um, so, so we have a little bit better idea of where we're going. As you go with your story, it may change, and that's okay. Stories have a habit of, um, and, and usually it's deep into the process when we think we're finally getting a handle on it, they have a habit of telling you, uh-uh, that's not what I'm about. I'm about something different. And we have to sit back and go, oh, yeah, you are something different. And usually it's a good thing, and we go back and fix everything leading into that, and we have a richer story. It's usually something that has an emotional context. Um, so it's okay for that to change, but it's a starting point. And I think just the process of working and writing this idea uh, gets us started. You, you know, you, you've got to put something on paper. If you let it stay in your head, then it's never going to get done. The other aspect of it is very, if you're a, if you uh, have sold your book rights and you're doing a book for a major publisher, pretty early in the process, they're going to come to you and say, "Hey, we need a synopsis of your book uh, so that we can put it in our catalog, or we can put it on Amazon to uh, get pre-orders." And you know, it's it's basically the same thing that goes on the book flaps or uh, on the back cover of your of your book. So you panic and you try to figure out what to write and how to say it. And that's why I think it's, it's good to go in and start to work on this from the very beginning. So that, and, and it even separates yourself from the story and say, well, I want to write a synopsis or a logline about a story that I want to read that would get me excited about reading it. Like I said, it can always change. So, you'll notice that my synopsis is just a fleshed out version of the log line. And here it is. Red, oh, let me start again here because I just screwed it up. Meet Red, a quirky, headstrong 10 year old who longs to live in her own perfect paradise, far away from her annoying foster family. But when a UFO mistakenly kidnaps her, 
Red finds herself farther away than she could have possibly imagined, across the galaxy and aboard an enormous spaceship owned by the Aquilari, an ancient creature with a taste for rare and unusual treasures. Before Red can be discovered as a stowaway, the great ship crashes on a small deserted planet, leaving her marooned with a menagerie of misfit aliens. With her newfound friend, a small gray alien named Tawi, Red must find a way to survive the hostile castaways, evade the ravenous wildlife, and contend with Goose, the planet's grumpy, felinoid custodian. Surely this can't be the paradise she's hoping for. So with this, you can see I've fleshed out my original logline uh, and added some, some more conflict into it. It's full of conflict. Um, and then even offered up kind of a, a question or a premise at the end of the synopsis for the audience to go to understand what the, where we're going with the story. Surely this can't be the paradise she's hoping for. It leaves a, an open ending to it. Um, if you want to take a look at this, this is uh, up on Amazon. And, um, you know, uh, I learned how to write it by looking at synopsis, synopses of other books and, and movies that I love. And it's a great way to learn. Look and see what masters have done. So, my process at this point, if it's a book that I am just starting, I have to explore my characters visually. What would they look like? And this helps, and I'm doing this simultaneously with the writing. I'm writing the character, I'm, and I'm trying to see what this character would look like within that context. So I went all over the place with, with red uh, visually. And uh, these are very early drawings from 2007, 2008. Um, I ended up with this one. I really liked this one, uh, but it was quickly vetoed uh, by my daughter, Jenny, because uh, Red was not smiling. Um, I could have spent a little time and added a smile, but I decided uh, to move on. What I did start to come up with at this point was Red is missing a shoe. It's a, it's a, it's kind of an odd little thing. You see a kid running around with no shoe. Why is she? It, it leaves a question in your mind. Why doesn't she have a shoe? From a visual perspective or a storytelling perspective, here's a kid who has something that's missing something. Um, and from a storytelling perspective, here's a. Uh, you, you, have you ever been driving down the road and you look out on the side of the road and there's always like one shoe out on the side of the road? It's never. Um, it's never two, it's always just one shoe. And obviously that's, that's gotta be because there's some faulty alien technology that when they beam people aboard their ships, um, one of the shoes is left behind. Um, so I moved on from this one. And uh, I did this one right here, which uh, I liked. I really liked this version. Uh, but this character is quiet, reserved. She kind of reminds me of like a Miyazaki character. But ultimately, this isn't the character of my story. Um, so I moved on once again. And then I did this one. And I really liked this one. And I think, looking back, the reason I liked it is it didn't look like my style of drawing. It looked like something that... It reminded me of some of the visual development I'd seen of a Pixar movie, just not as well drawn. So I kind of liked that. And this was a direction I, I started pushing in. And... Um, I developed her, uh, cleaned her up a little bit, this became red, and eventually, um, as my style settled into her, this is red. Um, and you kind of see the character here. This is a kid who's, who's um, she's got a certain confidence in her. Um, she's, she's not shy, she's uh, ready to go, and um, she's missing that shoe. There's something missing about this kid. So the next character I had to create was the caretaker of the planet, Goose. And originally, Goose was imagined as a giant canine. And I love this idea that, that uh, man's best friend meets a lonely little girl looking for family, and he doesn't want to have anything to do with her. Uh, but ultimately, um, here's another one. I, I, this one I really, really love. Um, ultimately, the story needed a character that was more anthropomorphic. And I, I had the idea that maybe Goose was a feline or a felinoid uh, alien. 
whose glory days were over and, and his, uh, his hair, his mane had started falling out. Um, and, um, but then it's, it's trying to discover what his character was. I knew he needed to be grumpy. All right. That was, that was, uh, I, I knew that he had to be a antagonist of sorts, but he also had to be likable and, um, and fun. And, and the audience did, even though they're being resisted, they're trying to resist liking him. They do kind of like him. And I found inspiration in uh, Walter Matthau, a kind of a cross between his roles in The Odd Couple and uh, The Bad News Bears. And that's when I came up with this goose. And, um, and this is basically where he stayed. And he's, uh, he's been a fan favorite, and, and he's a lot of fun to draw. And, um, and it's funny that a lot of readers recognize the Walter Matthau aspect to him long before I even said publicly that that's who the inspiration was. And there are a lot of other visual uh, development drawings as I uh, went through and developed other characters, but um, uh, too much for, to go through today. Um, so, pantsing versus plotting. Pantsing is another word for discovery writing. Uh, writing an animation, if we were animating something straight ahead from the very beginning all the way to the end, and this is the same thing in writing. Um, discovery writing is starting and just writing and going all the way through. As an author, you don't really know uh, what's coming next. It's all, uh, it all happens as you're writing it. And um, of course, outlining or plotting is outlining, and, and uh, that's creating the story and knowing where your climax will be and what happens in the resolution and finding all those elements before you start to fill it in with the individual scenes and the, and, and the uh, story. Now, discovery writing is great for novels because a novel can go on for a thousand pages and, and it can meander for hundreds of pages. Um, and, and a reader would still be satisfied at the end and think they just wrote, read a really great book. Um, but um, with film, um, and I think graphic novels as well, we consume it in, a, in one temporal bite where we sit down and see a movie from start to finish, and we sit down and oftentimes we read a graphic novel from start to finish in one sitting, and it seems much more finite. Um, it's not something we carry around with us for a week and it's trying to steal time to read a little bit more. And there's an economic consideration as well. With film, the shorter a movie is, the more showings a theater can have of the movie. So you get a movie, a big three-hour movie like uh, Titanic and um, uh, Lord of the Rings. Those are the exceptions of the rule that those films become blockbusters. Because a, a Disney animated film at 80 minutes can be shown more times during the day than Lord of the Rings. Of course, not as many people will go see it at night, but you can make more mo money with a, a 90 minute movie than you can with a three hour movie. So there's an economic consideration. Uh, and like film, there's an economic side, uh, to, side to the size of a published book. The more pages that you have in a book, the more expensive, and even more so if it's full color. Graphic novels are printed on nicer stock and more expensive paper stock than a novel is. So because of this, and, and the production time alone, um, it, it takes so long uh, for me to do a 192-page a, a book. Um, so because of this, there's some degree of plotting uh, that happens. It's imperative, really, that you have to know where you're going with this book and, and where the climax is going to be. because your audience needs to be satisfied too. An audience really knows um, in a film where these certain things are supposed to hit. 10 minutes into the film, if they haven't seen some kind of inciting incident, they're getting a little antsy. They don't know where this movie's going. That, uh, that first plot point needs to hit at a certain time or the audience really is, is, is wondering what's happening. So we've kind of conditioned with the language of film how we experience short or movies and, and graphic novels. Um, so it's really important that, that uh, we think about plotting. 
Now, the, the process that I take is I like to use index cards to start my, uh, my storytelling. Um, and it, it's, uh, I think, a great way to start because it's um, uh, with a Sharpie and index cards, it doesn't seem as, as um, what, what word am I looking for, um, um, final as typing it onto uh, Word and seeing you know the beautiful typefaces and everything, and that just looks so nice and finished. And you're a little more afraid to make mistakes at that point. Writing on cards and, and, and tearing them up and throwing them away and, and moving ideas around is a great way to start your story. Um, this actually is not uh, from my, uh, my book. It's actually a, a, a storyboard from when I was working on Phineas and Ferb. And uh, there's an element here that, um, that's also really important. Um, and that's the use of color cards. Those of you who know the the uh, st the, the Disney show Phineas and Ferb know that we had three storylines going uh, in every show, and those storylines had to come together at the end. There's Phineas and Ferb building something amazing in their backyard. There's their sister Candace trying to bust them because mom needs to know what they're doing because mom's not going to like it. And then there's their pet platypus Perry who does nothing until the boys turn their back and then Perry becomes a secret agent who goes and fights his nemesis, Dr. Doofenshmirtz, who is busy creating an innator that's going to cause some kind of havoc in the tri-state area. And at the end of the story, all these things come together and somehow Dr. Doofenshmirtz's innator wipes out what Phineas and Ferb has been doing and uh, Candace gets there just in time and her mom sees nothing. How do you track a story like that? Well, visually, when we're pitching the story to Dan and Swampy in the first week, we're pitching on note cards, and we use the colors of the note cards so they can easily see, and we can easily see, where those different storylines are going. So blue may be Phineas and Ferb in this one, uh, red may be um, uh, Candace, and green may be Perry. I don't remember exactly what it was. So using color cards sometimes is fun, too. Um, I often use different color cards to track subplots in my story. Um, the, the subplot, the story of um, Gene and, and Stu and uh, Dell is a subplot of Red's Planet and tracking and making sure that I'm fulfilling that story, that I've set something up in the beginning, I want it to pay off at the end. I want you to not feel like, hey, what happened to these guys? Um, so that's a great way to track it. If you're using index cards, here's some things to think about. Keep it short. Use as few words as possible on the cards, okay? And, and um, write big using a Sharpie, right? You can't, you can't write that much when you're using a Sharpie. Um, keep the cards uh, general. Keep it just, you know, very simple ideas on there. Don't get very detailed. Um, just let it represent a story point, a scene, or a sequence. Uh, you don't have to have a card for every little thing or dialogue. Um, and uh, and I yeah and and keep it to uh, less than less than fifty cards. You can probably do it in, in fewer than that, but uh, less than fifty cards. Most movies can be told in fifty cards or less. Um, and uh, and, and like I said, write big so you can see them from a distance. And then you put them on the floor, you move them around, you don't have to have a cork board. And, um, and then when you're ready to go, you stack them up in order, you take them with you, you go to Barnes & Noble or Starbucks to work, you always have those note cards. When you get the story to a point where it's kind of working, then maybe you can find a more permanent place to put it, and then there's the time to put it into a writing program. Now I like to use the program Scrivener, and one of the things I like about Scrivener is uh, there are uh, all your files for the project are kept in one package file. So we open up a Scrivener file, and it's got all the the pages from your books, the um, the story pages. It's got a folder in there where you can have character descriptions, settings, research, notes. You can put images in there. You can put uh, web links and and uh, maps and whatever you want to have. And they have some great templates for doing um, uh, scripts, whether it's a, a, a comic script or a play or, or a screenplay. 
So it's a great program, and it also has a um, corkboard function where you can have cards just like you did um, you know, on, on paper and pencil, analog. And you can type your cards into there and start to have your story, and then you're allowed to go and, um, and start to flesh those cards out within the program. I really enjoy it. It's one of the, the better programs, and it's relatively inexpensive. So um, the the way I work, uh, you know, comic scripts are are interesting because there's no real set format for a comic script, not like a TV uh, teleplay or a screenplay. So you you if you're working for a publisher, they're going to have a very specific format they want you to write in to send in a sample or do to do a script for them. But if you're writing your own book. You can make the script up any way you want to. Um, the only person who may be reading it will be your editor. Uh, and as long as it's clear to them what you're writing, it should be fine. My scripts tend to look like uh, screenplays. As a matter of fact, when I do my first pass at a Red's Planet book, I don't even think about the pages. I write it as a screenplay. And it's only the a second or third pass that I start to format it into pages of a actual graphic novel and think about where these you know what panels and what dialogue is going to be where so it's just a very uh, conventional um, format with uh, the page very specific page one there at the top and the resolution probably isn't good enough for you to see that Titles, captions, dialogue, sound effects all go in the uh, character um, function so that they all appear there in the center with the dialogue or the caption underneath it. And um, this is good because you can quickly see how much dialogue you're, you're writing, how many words are on the page. And it's very important not to do too many words. Um, like I said, comics are primarily visual. If you have too many words, um, there's no room for visuals. Um, so there's, um, and then each panel is also described. And I try to keep my descriptions very short because I'm I'm drawing it. I know what's in there. But even if you're working with a collaborator, leave room for that collaborator to do what they are good at and what they like to do. Here's a a, a, um, a layout here of of the some pages from Red's Planet Book One. And another thing that I, I have seen, or, or, or I'm sorry, one thing that I, that I do is I, I create double page spreads in my book. I love the idea of, of the reveal of a double page spread. When, uh, uh, when we were driving back from uh, Los Angeles, moving back to uh, Florida, I told my wife, you know, the drive's beautiful, but as you're driving through the American Southwest, the, the real, um, the real beauty is when you're going up over that mountain and you don't know what's on the other side and you hit the top of the mountain starting to go down in the next valley and there's the reveal, that amazing valley. And that's how I think about these, the storytelling with a two-page spread. So as I'm telling the story and I'm building up to it, I turn a page, I... I am moving you towards something. I want you to turn that page and have a certain experience. And a double page spread is a very unique experience. And I have several throughout each book. But it's a little tricky because if you'll notice, if you decide that one of the pages before that double page spread is um, uh, a page that, that you don't like and you want to delete it, you can't delete one page because it throws off the, uh, the division of pages here. They're in twos. So if you delete pages, you have to delete two pages. If you insert pages, you have to insert two pages. And so it's important in your storytelling that you're tracking the pages and you know um, that you know where these pages are going to be so that you don't make the mistake that instead of um, a two-page spread being on page 48 and 49, you messed up, deleted a page, and now the, page, the spread starts on page 47 and continues on the next page when you turn it. That doesn't work. So, one of the technical aspects of writing. 
The other thing is stylistically, and, and you can't see it in this slide, but stylistically in Red's Planet, I made the decision that chapters will always start on the right page and end on the left page. And I wanted to carry that through through the entire book. And the format of the title page is always the same uh, with, a, with a, um, a panel that covers about two thirds of the top of the page and then uh, several panels at the bottom of the page. It's, it's uh, Jeff Smith does it, but, but even before Jeff Smith, uh, the original Mad comic book did that as well. And it's just I'm really appealing storytelling format. And I always end a chapter on a single panel splash page. Another thing in writing pages is I like to do something at the end of the page um, called a button. And a button is, is, is a, uh, a line or a, um, uh, something that kind of ties everything together. Okay? If you think of a button, it, it, um, you, know, you button your shirt, it, it fastens your shirt together. It, it uh, um, what, brings it all together. Um, so a button in storytelling is uh, that last scene or that last line that kind of that kind of ties up that page at the at the end, but oftentimes it also asks a question. It may be a joke, it may be a question, it may be something exciting, but it's something that makes you want to turn the page again. And um, I think this is something that's really worked well in the in the format of Red's Planet and. And I'd encourage everyone to, um, uh, to take a look and see what I've done with it. Um, I, um, I haven't, I'm not going to read these pages right now, um, but uh, take a look and see how at the end of each page, something happens that makes you want to turn that page and see what happens on the next page. And this is something very unique in the storytelling of uh, comics that other books don't have, and that is we can decide... Uh, we know exactly where our pages are, are going to be and what's going to be on the page that, uh, that follows it. J.K. Rowling can write a Harry Potter book and write about a big reveal of Hogwarts Castle, but she doesn't know if that reveal is going to be on the same page or when you turn the page because her typewritten manuscript is very different than the typeset uh, book, and the hardback is probably different than the paperback. So we're in a unique situation here where we can control what the reader sees and, and uh, when they see it. So it's something to play with and, and, um, and enjoy storytelling with that. Okay, so we're getting toward the end of the talk here. I want to give you some don'ts because don'ts are important. I always give my kids the don'ts first. When you're writing, don't write long descriptions. Don't get um, too caught up in, in your, um, in your uh, settings and, and, um, and what's on the table or what they're wearing doesn't really matter. It's visual and um, the, just describe the most important things. Don't write long dialogue. One of the things I learned in, in uh, working on Phineas and Ferb it was uh, Swampy Marsh constantly telling me, cut it, cut it. You don't have that much time in television and you don't have that much room in a graphic novel. You don't need all the adverbs. You don't know, need to repeat the same thing multiple times in different ways. Cut it, get to the story, move it along. And also don't be afraid to cut your favorite lines because they just aren't fitting in to the story you're telling. It's taking everyone in a different direction. And don't overload with panels. Don't put too many panels on a page and don't too, put too much stuff in the panel for the artist to draw. Um, a, a page can, uh, nine panels max on a page. Uh, go look at, at uh, Dave Gibbon's work on Watchmen. Watchmen is a beautiful example of a nine panel page. There's a reason he did a nine panel page though, because nine panels kind of ticks off like a clock, tick, tick, you just read them. They're all the same. They go very quickly in the same order. Visually, you look at it, and it's just like a metronome. Why? Because the whole story is about moving toward an event in time. There's a clock ticking throughout the entire story. 
nine panel page. Um, anything more than that, and um, it's just too much to see. And you're not going to be able to see the artwork, and the dialogue's going to hide most of it. So don't overload with panels. Um, and here's some do's. Do end on a, a do end a page on a button or a question, something that makes the a cliffhanger, if you will, to, to turn the page. Think about the reveal. When they turn the page, what is your what is your audience going to your reader going to be uh, reading? And keep your story moving. Don't get off on tangents or 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 things that really aren't important to bringing the theme of your story together. Keep it moving in the right direction. So here's some resources. Um, I don't like to overload resources. There's so many books and resources that have helped me through the years. But I just want to give two resources in two different categories. Um, understanding Comics. If you're new to comics, or even if you're not, Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics is a, a great book to understand how comics work, why they work, what happens to us when we read it. It's an amazing work. I read it when it first came out. And uh, it's, it's some heavy stuff, too. Uh, Scott is a, a brilliant guy. He'll make your head explode if you're talking to him because he's just on a different level. And Making Comics is a great book as well. When I got Making Comics, I was already a professional artist, so... Um, but it, but I see the value in it, and I, I always get excited with really good how-to books. He covers a lot of great stuff, and it, and most of it's it's all still relevant now because he talks about digital work as, as well. And with screenwriting, uh, the book that I started with and what most people started with back in the 1970s was Screenplay by the late Sid Field, and it was the first real book in, on screenwriting that was available, you know, to the to the masses. And um, screenwriting books are funny. Everybody has an opinion about them. And uh, they oftentimes don't like this book or don't like that book. And I get it. That's okay. Um, but there's still some valuable stuff to learn from Sid Field. I think there's um, there's a danger always in whatever you read about writing or art that you may fall into a trap of a formula. But you gotta start somewhere. You, every artist that starts needs to start by learning simple geometric shapes. Sid Feel is the geometric shapes of screenwriting. And Robert McKee's story, another divisive <laughs> personality and individual. I love Robert McKee's story because it isn't a formula. He's teaching the principles behind story, and he and he brings them from sources, uh, you know, from from uh, uh, Plato's um, uh, um, um, writings on on uh, drama to uh, other other historical works on on uh, on fiction and drama, and he brings them all together into a, a very thick, heavy read. It takes several times for me because I'm not that smart. I'm usually the dumbest guy in the room. It takes a long time for me to understand what he's saying, but it is a really good book. And it's a great book from when, for when you're, you're done with your story and you go, what? Uh, it's, it doesn't seem to be working. Why isn't it working? Then you go read that book and you go, oh, well, maybe this is what's not working. So, some final words. You want to write a graphic novel. That's great. You want to draw a graphic novel. Fantastic. Do it now. Uh, if you put it off a day, then you'll put it off forever. If you say, I'll start next week, next week never comes. There's never been a better time to create your own stories. The internet is essentially a free platform. You can, you can show your work, you can publish your work, and if it's good, you grow an audience. Um, and even things that aren't good get an audience on the internet. Now, you may not make a living at it, but honestly, even the people who are published by big New York publishers don't make a living at it all the time. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's probably more who don't than do. But if you don't try, and it's something that you've always wanted to do, and you don't try it, you'll never know if you can do it. So I'd encourage everyone to, to give it a try. And, um, and don't put it off. Do it. Jump right in with both feet. So um, that's really all I have here. 
Um, let me see if I can come right back to the camera. And I don't know if we're still here. Are we here? There we go. Uh, Jenny Manning, where did you get your visual inspiration for Tawi's design? Well, it's very interesting. Tawi is actually um, a character I created when I was uh, 10 years old. And he was uh, originally a, a fly. I had a, a, a cousin who was a couple of years older than I was, and he would antagonize me all the time. And there was one day when he said uh, that, that he had an invisible fly uh, that, named Tawi, and that um, I couldn't see Tawi. And he'd say, there he is over there on the, on the wall. And I'd go, I, I see him. And he would go, uh-uh, he's not there anymore. He's over there on the TV. I see him. Uh uh, he's a. And so this happened all summer long. And uh, so what I decided to do was draw a picture of what I thought Tawi looked like. And I, I drew him on. Um, I, I drew him on a piece of paper, and I cut him out. And then I flipped him over and drew the backside of him as well, because you know that's what you do. And um, I put him in a cigar box and and closed it. And I said, I have Tawi in the cigar box. Let me see him. And I said, mm mm. So that's how Tawi started, and he was actually a comic character of mine all through um, high school and uh, into college. So for some reason, when I started doing Red's Planet, I kind of fell, felt like, uh, and Tawi kind of morphed from being a fly early on to being, I, I never knew what Tawi was. And I realized, hey, this would be a perfect little friendly gray alien, and, and uh, so I put Tawi in there. Um, but the design was originally based, it just looked like an old cartoon character. It even had the white gloves back then. Matt Baker, how did you get experience with sequential art? For those looking to make comics of our own, where should we start? Um, you know, Matt, my, my experience in sequential art, I think as many people came from reading it. Um, my love of filmmaking came from seeing the films of uh, the early films of Steven Spielberg, and I wanted to be a filmmaker. Watching Walt Disney cartoons made me want to be an animator. So reading great comics made me want to do comics. Um, there were, uh, you know, I grew up in the uh, the nineteen, the late nineteen sixties and early nineteen seventies, and Marvel comics were huge. I loved uh, the John Romita Jr. Spider Man's and the uh, uh, the Ross Andrews Spider-Mans, the Neil Adams Batmans. So I always had a lot of comics that I loved. And in the 1980s, I discovered uh, Will Eisner, which really saw, made me see how you could push the storytelling. Plus, in the 1980s, the big self-publishing era started. Um, and you had uh, Cerebus, and um, uh, eventually in the 90s, Jeff Smith started, and, and, and it really took off. It was the height of the self-publishing era. So just reading good comics, I think, is the, the place where you start. Now, Will Eisner wrote a couple of books on sequential art. Um, and I think uh, Eisner coined that phrase, sequential art. He wasn't real happy with graphic novels um, because they're not always novels. And uh, there's some people who don't, know what graphic novels are too that sounds uh, pornographic to him. Um, so sequential art was a phrase that uh, Eisner coined and he wrote a book uh, on uh, working in sequential art, the art of sequential art I think it might be called, and there's some beautiful storytelling techniques and stuff. And um, so like anything, inspiration comes from what you surround yourself uh, with. and. Um, and uh, what you bring in. It's important you bring in the good stuff. If you bring in bad stuff, you're going to turn around and do storytelling that way. And uh, so it's important. If you're, if you're a filmmaker, you want to watch the best films. If you're a writer, you want to read the best books um, because you, you set your goals high um, because you know that you're, you, you will probably fall somewhere below that. You know? and, and so read the best. And, and you'll learn, you know, studying masters. So I don't see any more uh, questions. And, um, and uh, like I said, if you have a question and you're watching this video replay, type them in the comments and I'll pop by uh, every once in a while and, and, and 
try to answer your questions the best I can. So, hey, everybody, thanks for watching. Uh, I don't know how to get off this crazy thing, but, um, but I think that's done. We're done for the day. So thanks again, and I'll catch you guys next time.